Now this video is in collaboration with Tim over at Kitchen and Craft, so on his channel he's making a sourdough Neapolitan style pizza baked in his uni pizza oven. So be sure to head over there and check that out once you're done with this video, it'll be the first link in the description below. Now in case you're not familiar with Detroit style pizza, it's defined by its rectangular shape and its thick spongy crust, and it's traditionally baked in a steel pan with toppings spreading all the way to the edges in order to create a charred and crispy perimeter. So in order to achieve that light and spongy crust, we're going to use a relatively high hydration dough enriched with a bit of olive oil similar to what you might see with a focaccia dough. And it's actually pretty simple to make compared to most sourdough breads, so let's get started. And the first thing we're going to do is mix the dough. So go ahead and get out a large bowl and add 320 grams of water along with 60 grams of your mature sourdough starter and stir to evenly distribute it. Now you'll notice that I'm not using a leaven here, and that's because this recipe is pretty forgiving, and I found that it doesn't really make a difference whether you use the starter at its peak, as long as you use it within about 24 hours of its last feeding. Then you'll just want to add 400 grams of bread flour and stir until the flour is fully saturated. So this will make enough dough for two 8x10 pizzas, but of course you can scale the recipe depending on the size of your pan and how many pizzas you want to make. Then once your dough is fully mixed, just move it to a warm environment, and in this case I'm using an 80 degree environment which is about 27 degrees celsius. So I'm using my proofing box to maintain that temperature, but the nice thing about this recipe is that again it is pretty forgiving, so if you don't have a proofing box or any other way to create a warm environment, you can just leave the dough at room temperature and it'll still work fine as long as you follow the visual cues that I'm going to mention in this video. So with the temperature and timing that I'm using here, the entire process will take about 10 hours until the pizza is ready to bake. So if you get it started in the morning, it'll work out perfectly to have it ready by dinner time. But as always, I'll leave my recommended time schedule in the full post on my website. So once you've got your dough transferred into your warm environment, we're just going to leave it there for about 30 minutes. And in the meantime, we'll want to prepare a mixture of 30 grams of water and 10 grams of salt, which we'll add to the dough after this resting period. So you'll notice that after that 30 minutes, the dough should be nice and extensible, and at this point we'll just go ahead and add our salt and water mixture. Then just thoroughly fold it into the dough, and at this point I also like to transfer my dough to a separate, clear rectangular container so that I can better gauge the bulk fermentation. But of course you can also just leave it in the original bowl if you prefer. Either way, you'll want to line your container with about a half a tablespoon of olive oil, and then drizzle about another half a tablespoon on top of the dough. Then cover it up and return the dough back to your warm environment for about another 45 minutes. At this point, it's time to perform one set of stretch and folds to start to develop a bit of gluten in the dough. So for these stretch and folds, you'll just want to grab a small portion of the dough and stretch it up and over itself, then fold it back down and repeat that process a total of about 4-8 to eight times around the perimeter of the dough. Then once that's done, cover your dough back up and return it to your warm environment for another 45 minutes. And after that time, we're going to perform one set of coil folds, which is a slightly more gentle form of folding, and it's going to set up our dough to become nice and aerated during the bulk fermentation. So for these, just pick the entire dough up, and let the side furthest away from you fold underneath, then set it back on top of itself. Then pick it back up and let the side closest to you fold underneath, and again set it back down. Then rotate your container 90 degrees, and perform the same process on the remaining two sides. Then once that's done, again cover your dough and return it back to your warm environment, this time for about another 3-6 to six more hours until the dough has doubled in size. So in my 80 degree environment, it usually takes about 4-4.5 four to four and a half hours to double in size, but again this dough is pretty forgiving, so even if your environment is a different temperature than mine, it'll still work fine, but just keep in mind that that temperature will determine how quickly the dough rises. But either way, once it doubles in size, you know it's ready to go. And at that point, it's time to divide the dough and transfer it to your baking pan for a final proofing. So since I'm making enough dough for two pizzas here, I like to weigh them out to make sure that they're the exact same size, then return one to my plastic container and put that in the refrigerator so that I can bake it tomorrow. So that's another great thing about this recipe because you can throw the dough into your refrigerator for about 24 hours at any point in the process and then just pick up from there right where you left off. So when I make it, I usually bake one pizza the first day and then one the next day. So for the pizza that I'm going to bake today, I'm going to throw it straight into my baking pan, which I've again lined with some extra virgin olive oil. And since this dough is pretty extensible, I like to sort of let it fold over itself as I place it into the container. And this pan that I'm using here is a steel pan, so it helps the edges to get nice and charred and crispy, which is one of those defining aspects of a Detroit style pizza. So the two traditional sizes of this type of pan are 8x10 inches and 10x14 inches, and I'm using the 8x10 inch version here. So I'll leave both linked below, and the bigger one is about twice the size of the smaller one, so if you are using that, you can just use the entire dough from this recipe rather than dividing it as I did in the previous step. 
And if you don't have one of these, don't let that discourage you from making it. It'll still turn out great in any sort of baking pan that you might have. So once you've got the dough in your pan, just stretch it out as far as it'll go, but it doesn't have to go all the way to the edges at this point. We're gonna let it rest here for about half an hour so that the dough can relax, and at that point, we'll stretch it out the rest of the way. So just cover the dough with plastic wrap, or in this case, I'm using these biodegradable dough covers from Challenger Breadware. So this video isn't sponsored, but I just happened to see these on their website, and it's actually a really cool product. So they're meant for covering banditons during the final proofing, so you don't have to worry about plastic waste every time you make sourdough bread. So I really like them, and of course, I'll leave them linked below. Either way, just return your dough to your warm environment and let it rest for another 30 minutes, which again will allow the dough to relax so that we can stretch it out the rest of the way. So at that point, just top it with a bit more olive oil and stretch it out to the edges, trying to be as gentle as you can with it. At this point, it should be extensible enough to cover the entire pan, but if it does shrink back to the center, just give it another 30 minute rest and repeat that same process. But assuming it does fill your pan at this point, just cover it back up and let it rest for another one to two hours in your warm environment until the dough has risen a bit more and becomes nice and bubbly. And while you're waiting for the dough to rise, it's the perfect time to make your pizza sauce. Which is relatively simple to do, but it does take a bit of time because the sauce needs to be cooked down a bit in order to achieve that signature Detroit style pizza flavor. So start by heating up a pan over low heat and add about one and a half tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil, along with five cloves of grated garlic. You just want the garlic to sweat out a bit, but not burn, so be sure to keep it at a low heat at this point. Then add about a half a teaspoon each of thyme and oregano, and you can use either dried or fresh. In this case, I'm using dried oregano and fresh thyme just because that's what I had on hand. Then add about a quarter teaspoon of red pepper flakes or more depending on how spicy you like your sauce. So just let those cook over low heat for about 30 seconds to a minute until it becomes nice and aromatic, and the garlic and spices release their flavors into the oil. Again, you don't want the garlic to burn, so make sure to keep this at a low heat. Then add one 28 ounce can of crushed tomatoes, and I prefer to use San Marzano tomatoes for the best possible flavor. So if you don't have crushed tomatoes, you can of course just crush them yourself in a food processor, which is actually what I did here. Then add two teaspoons of sugar to provide some sweetness to the sauce, and season it with a bit of salt and pepper. Then let that simmer until it's significantly thickened and reduced by about 25 to 50%, which should take about a half an hour. So that's why I'm using a wide pan, in this case my pan is 12 inches, because it'll help to speed up that reduction process. If you're using a narrow saucepan, it'll take a very long time to reduce, so I definitely recommend using a wide pan or a skillet as opposed to a saucepan. So again, this will be enough sauce for two small pizzas, so if you're only making one, you can of course cut this recipe in half. But once the sauce is reduced, just give it another taste and season it as necessary with salt and pepper, and you can even add more oregano, thyme, or red pepper flakes if you feel that it needs it. Then just set that aside for the time being. Now another defining feature of the Detroit style pizza is the fact that it uses Wisconsin brick cheese, which is a mild and slightly sweet cheese with an almost buttery and very melty texture which makes it perfect for pizza. But it can be hard to find and I actually had to buy mine on Amazon so I'll leave the one I bought linked below, but if you don't want to go through all of that you can just use a low moisture mozzarella instead. And of course you could top your pizza with whatever else you like, but the most traditional Detroit style pizza is just topped with pepperoni, so that's what I'm going to do here. And I actually sliced my own pepperoni not only because it's a better quality pepperoni, but because that way I can also customize the thickness of my slices. But of course you don't have to do that if you don't want to. And once the dough is almost done proofing, you'll also want to preheat your oven to 550 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 285 degrees Celsius. And once your dough is nice and bubbly like so, it's time to start topping. So traditionally with a Detroit style pizza, you'll first add the pepperoni, then the cheese, then the sauce. But personally, I prefer to add the cheese first, then the pepperoni, then the sauce. That way the pepperoni can get even more charred and crispy, which is what I like. So I use four ounces of cheese here, but to me the toppings on a pizza are all about customization. So just use as much or as little as you like. Personally, I like a higher ratio of sauce to cheese, so that's exactly what I'm doing here. And traditionally the sauce is added in a racing stripe pattern like so, but obviously that's optional. Then once your pizza is all topped, just throw it onto the top rack of your oven, which again should be set to 550 degrees Fahrenheit, for about 12 minutes. Then turn on the broiler to ensure that the top gets nicely charred and crispy, which should take just about another 3-5 to five more minutes. But you'll definitely want to keep an eye on it at this point to make sure that it doesn't burn. 
Now, I do like my pizza pretty nicely charred, but if you prefer a bit of a lighter crust, I'd recommend baking for just 10 minutes at 550 degrees Fahrenheit, then turning on the broiler again for about 3-5 to five minutes. So this will prevent the sides and bottom of the pizza from becoming overly charred before the top has a chance to cook. So now if you want to learn how to make a sourdough Neapolitan style pizza, again be sure to check out Tim's video over at Kitchen and Craft, which will be linked in the bottom right corner of the screen and in the description below. So there you go. I'll see you all in the next one.